I now have the honor of introducing your commencement speaker, Dr. Marcus Erickson. Dr. Erickson is a native of Metairie, Louisiana, and received both a bachelor's and master's degrees from the University of New Orleans. He developed a fascination with nature as he collected snakes, turtles, and alligators, taking his first job at the Audubon Zoo. He is currently executive director and co-founder of the Five Gyres Institute. He received his PhD in science education from the University of Southern California in 2003, months before embarking on a 2,000 mile, five month journey down the Mississippi River on a homemade raft. His experience on the river led to a career studying the ecological impacts of plastic marine pollution, which has included expeditions um, sailing 35,000 miles through five subtropical gyres to discover new garbage patches of plastic pollution in the Southern Hemisphere. Still rafting, his most recent adventure sent him and a colleague across the Pacific Ocean from California to Hawaii on junk, a homemade raft floating on 15,000 plastic bottles and a Cessna airplane fuselage as a cabin. The journey, which was 2,600 miles in 88 days, brought attention to the work of the Five Gyres Institute, the organization he co-founded with his wife, Anna Cummings. The Institute is committed to marine conservation through research, education, and adventure, studying and lecturing about the plague of plastic waste in our watersheds and in, in the sea. His first book titled, My River Home, chronicled his Mississippi River adventure, parallel with his tour as a Marine in the Gulf War in 1991. The experience of war, of war sailing across the, the gyres with diverse crews and long rafting uh, voyages led to a strong conservation ethic, supporting the theme of conservation and of self-preservation, uh, a rationale crossing all boundaries between all people. Before I introduce him, I want to introduce his wife, Anna Cummings. Anna, would you please rise? And, and Dr. Erickson's guest, would you please? And now it's my pleasure to introduce one of our own, Dr. Marcus Erickson. Good evening. What an honor it is to see you walk the stage tonight and earn your degrees. Congratulations. It's only 20 years that I, I sat right where you are. And I can remember, you know, going back 20 years, sitting in my apartment near UNO, studying for finals, you know, watching TV, watching Night Court, watching John Larroquette, and thinking, you know, I want to share the stage with one of these guys someday and make the big bucks. Well, I'm halfway there. It's not bad. It's only 20 years ago. You know, I didn't think I would ever get where you are, much less where I'm standing here, you know, right now. And I grew up in Metairie. I worked at the Audubon Zoo for a few years. I joined the Marine Corps Reserves out of high school so I can go to school at the same time. And that school was right here at UNO. I want to share with you what I wish I had been told 20 years ago to give me riches. You know, besides the riches I would have earned investing in Microsoft or Starbucks, but not riches, but a richness, a richness in life. So here's a story for you. I remember sitting in biology class, and again, goes back 20 years, and a fellow Marine walked in the classroom and looked at me and he said, hey, Marcus, we got to go. We're going to war. So I dropped out of UNO that day, and three months later, I found myself fighting outside of Kuwait City in the 1991 Persian Gulf War. Now that, that took a year out of my graduation plan, and it left these lingering sort of questions in my head about what's worth fighting for. What do we as a nation value and send our young people to kill and be killed for? What is important? came back to UNO to learn more and to make sense of my experience. Now, how many of you graduating now are Iraq or Afghanistan veterans? It's not easy coming home. And for many of us, there are challenges that that stand in our way. 
How many of you are, are parents while you're students? Quite a few. I have a nine-month-old baby, and I have no idea how some of you can be full-time parents and students and keep a job all at the same time. I mean, how many of you have two jobs or have student loans to pay back? I mean, it's not... <laughs> Everyone raise your hands on that one. So you see, it's not easy in the world today to, to keep a job, to, to have a home, to save money. But you're here. You're here, and you should be extremely proud of yourselves. And I am so honored that I get to witness your graduation. You made a promise to yourself, and you kept it. And here you are now graduating. And I want to tell you more. Let me go back to the, the, Marine, the Marine Corps and the Gulf War for a minute. Now, I remember sitting in a foxhole. This is just outside Kuwait City. And there were 100-foot flames from burning oil wells all around us. And I said to the Marine next to me, and we're covered in little specks of oil, and I said, if we survive this war, let's build a raft like Huck Finn and Tom Sawyer. And, well, years later, when I finally finished graduate school, I took 232 two-liter plastic bottles, tied them all together, built a raft, and I had a friend, actually a fellow UNO classmate, drive me to North Minnesota and drop me off, where the river is so skinny, 10 feet wide, this deep, you can jump across it. I saw New Orleans five months later, drifting 2,000 miles down the Mississippi River, I discovered the complexity of my relationship, my interdependence with nature. And also, I, I understood again the goodness of people, something I, I may have lost in my, my experience in war. You see, I was often fed and housed and even given clothes by people I'd met along the way, perfect strangers. I remember somewhere in Arkansas, floating down the river, I saw three young people fishing. And I pull up in my little bottle raft, which I called the bottle rocket, pulled up to them, and I said, where's the next landing? Where can I park my raft and camp for the night? And they said, just go a half mile down the river and you'll see a landing. So I get there, I set up my tent, and by 9, 10 o'clock, 10 p.m., I'm snug in my sleeping bag, and I see these headlights blaring through the tent. I unzip the tent, it's the same three young people. They had two plates of food. One was piled full of turkey, cranberry sauce, and stuffing. The other piled with pie and cake. That was Thanksgiving Day in 2003. These perfect strangers met a stranger in the river and just gave out of the goodness of who they are. But what I also saw was plenty of trash going down America's greatest river all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. I mean, I can always see a plastic bag or a bottle or a, a styrofoam cup, a fork, a knife, or a cup lid right on the side of my raft, heading to the same place down to Venice, Louisiana. And I mean tons of it. From the highest mountains, plastic trash flows downhill to the sea. And it struck me as morally wrong that we allow that to happen. From the Gulf War to the Gulf of Mexico, I had had enough. I had had enough of wasting people and wasting nature. With that much time on the river, I mean, I fell in love with the river, and I felt compelled to do something. But see, at this point, there were no more lingering moral questions in my head, but there were scientific questions. Now remember, you may follow what you believe in, but you've got to have good science to back it up, otherwise you will get led astray. Now my specific question, the piece of the pie of sustainability that I carved for myself was, what is all this plastic trash doing to the rest of the world, doing to the oceans, to the other living things that are in the world's oceans, and the people that live there? So my wife, Anna Cummins, and I, we began the Five Gyres Institute. We raised half a million dollars, it took a long time to get there. We launched 11 sailing expeditions around the world, 35 to 40,000 miles of sailing. What we discovered was that roughly 21% of our Earth's surface in the middle of the ocean is covered in a thin veneer, a thin layer of this microplastic confetti. And it didn't exist 50 years ago. Now, this startling scientific finding, which we've published since then, 
to tell the world our story, and since I like plastic bottle boats, we decided to build a big one. So we took 15,000 plastic bottles, and for a cabin, we used a, a Cessna airplane. And I, I think we're the first airplane to float across the Pacific Ocean from California to Hawaii in 88 very long days. Halfway across the ocean, I caught a fish, a fish called a rainbow runner, about this big. And at that point, we were hungry. We were out of food. I filleted the fish, and out of its stomach poured 15 small fragments of that microplastic confetti. But the fish that we harvest to feed the world are eating our trash. So with all my life experience on the water, seeing the waste of the world in the most remote places on the planet, I discovered something else. I found all of my answers. I found the richness in that connection to nature, to the Mississippi River, to the land that nourishes me, and the ocean that is so unforgiving of human ignorance and ego. I found an abundance of peace in fighting for conservation and for the basic human rights of other people. It makes simple sense. Conservation is self-preservation. I mean, think about it. How can we expect other people to fight for conservation of the land and sea, our life support systems, if they do not have access to education or health care or the security in their country or the equality of opportunity? Conservation and human rights are so tied together. So I chose for my mission is to clean up the world in my lifetime. And we'll see how close we get. You see, what I wish someone had told me 20 years ago is this, and I tell you now. Tie your work to your core values. You know what's right in the world? So grab onto one issue. Become an expert at that one little piece of the pie. If you try to take it all on, you're going to get depressed. Pick, on, pick one small piece of it and be the best at it. Work with others to make it right. I mean, trade your ego for we go. There's an amazing richness in solidarity towards fighting for a mission. So what's your mission? I mean, what is your mission? What do you want to accomplish in your career from this point forward? That's a question you must answer for yourself from here, here onward. So I'd like to end on this note. My daughter, she's nine months old. She's my first, and I can't imagine loving anyone as much as my child, maybe your child. My wife, Anna, we, we, cho we chose to bring her into the world. And I was thinking a little while ago that if my, if my little girl lives a full life, if she, if she reaches 88, she will see next century. I mean, she will see it all go by. She will see unprecedented challenges in overpopulation and resource scarcity. And maybe in the year 2100, she will have this opportunity to look before beautiful people like I am doing right now. And she can say one of two things. She could say, you know, we tried, but we just couldn't make it. And now we live behind walls and the world society has collapsed around us. Or she can say, it's because of my parents and their friends and that entire generation that saw the road ahead and took it on and they made it right. It's because of them that we have a livable world. That is a history that I know you will create. Thank you and congratulations on your achievement. Dr. Erickson, we're proud to count you as an alumnus and a member of the University of New Orleans family. We thank you for your example of citizenship, conservation, and environmental stewardship. Please accept this as a token of our appreciation.